So if you've had the feeling over the last several months that society is being torn apart, I'd like to offer you a simple explanation. Uh, it actually is. <laughs> um, now, you know, we as humans divide ourselves into all sorts of interesting uh, categories naturally. Um, one way that we do that is by organizing ourselves into cities. And this actually is a visualization of the GDP of the United States split in half. And what you can see here is that the most populated areas, mostly on the coasts, account for 50% of the GDP of the country, while the entire rest of the country accounts for the rest. And this is actually reflected in how the country voted back in November. Um, you can see that the bright blue areas there are areas that voted for Clinton, and the areas in red are people who voted for Trump. And uh, it was 2,623 counties uh, that voted for Trump and 489 for Clinton, but yet Clinton got a majority of the vote. Um, so, you know, we, we see that this kind of rural divide, uh, rural-urban divide happens in all sorts of political contexts around the world. We saw it in Brexit as well. And so I've been digging into this to try to understand it a little bit better. And so I went back to the year 2000 in the United States and tried to understand at what point people flipped over from voting from Republican to Democrat. And it turns out that if you organize all of the counties in the country by their population density and then sort and group those, you can see a clear crossover point. And it turns out to be about 1,000 people per square mile is when people flip their behavior from voting for a right-wing candidate to a left-wing candidate. Now, we can see this again reflected in 2004. Um, you can see the gray compared to 2000, and it sort of gets more extreme as we go over time. But the crossover point still remains about the same, about 1,000 people per square mile. So you can see that going all the way up into 2012 and 2016. And in 2016, indeed, the division is greater in that, in that year, in last year's election, than it was in any previous year. So I started to wonder, well, what might be driving some of this? So I did another kind of visualization graph, where what I did was took data from OpenStreetMap and looked at how much road mileage is necessary per person to support a uh, specific population density. And it turns out that when you get down to about 1,000 people per square mile, um, you end up kind of getting a flattening in the amount of road infrastructure that's required. And that, of course, also applies to sewers and other types of infrastructure. It's kind of the same as the physics of the you know, uh, circulatory system of an elephant versus a mouse, that sort of thing. It's, it's a similar kind of uh, curve. So, um, you know, that, that sort of explains, to some extent, why we might be attenuated around this urban-rural divide. And the idea that like, people in cities um, are probably interested in different things in terms of their tax dollar spending, you know, things like uh, public transportation or housing or healthcare, versus people in remote areas who might be more interested in roads and gasoline and cars. So I've also, over the last few years, been looking at other ways that we sort and divide ourselves. This is a visualization of my hometown, Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States. You may know it from The Wire. It's our little bit of marketing that we do for the city. <laughs> but um, what this is is a visualization of all the Twitter users in the city that I could find at a specific point. And each dot uh, is a Twitter user, and each line is a relationship between them, a friend-follower relationship. This is not a geographic map, just a visualization of Twitter users. But what we find is that people sort themselves very neatly into kind of categories that are quite clearly identifiable. So on the right, where it says geeks and TEDx, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm a geek and I do TEDx, so I'm kind of in the second E in geeks there. <laughs> um, and then uh, on the far left is mostly younger, uh, mostly African-American kids who are into hip hop and stuff like that. And what's kind of startling about this map is it really shows the racial segregation that exists in the city. People on the far left have almost no idea that the people on the far right even exist. When I've shown this map to people in the city, they kind of scratch their head and go, wow, this reshapes my mental model of how I thought the city worked. So when you see this kind of segregation, you can also kind of spot the same pattern in guess which city this is. This is St. Louis, Missouri in the United States. And if you recall, you know, we had a lot of violence in both St. Louis, first in St. Louis and then in Baltimore, and I predicted that we would probably see some violence in Baltimore were there to be a catalyzing incident. And indeed, we have the same pattern there. We've got kind of startup geeky people on the right, TEDx, and then on the far left, uh, it's mostly younger black folks listening to rap music, and there's very little overlap between these worlds. And indeed, you can see similar patterns here in Norway, but you guys are a little bit more cohesive than St. Louis or Baltimore. Um, you can see groups that clearly identify around football and sports, uh, maybe not surprisingly, a lot of places. Uh, innovation, tech, and education. 
uh, the Norway diaspora in Europe. There's sort of Norwegians all scattered throughout Europe that are plugged into this, and you can see them clustered there. Arts and culture, uh, politics and governance, activism and commentary. A lot of writers here in Norway, I found. <laughs> and then kind of mainstream media in the center. So the point of kind of showing you these divisions is that, like, you know, we as humans, we have, there's a principle called homophily, which is basically that birds of a feather kind of flock together, and we group into little subgroups kind of naturally. But what if people started to take advantage of those divisions and maybe even try to make them worse? Let's take a look at this. It's a battle for social media supremacy that could define this year's U.S. presidential election. Donald Trump's campaign used a London-based data analytics company to help advise on strategy. Now Donald Trump is paying them $5 million in September alone in the hope their profiling will take him all the way to the White House. Since June, a very sophisticated data analysis operation had been underway. This involved a British data science firm called Cambridge Analytica. Communication is fundamentally changing. But if you're going to spend a billion dollars, you want to be really ruthless about making sure that you're focusing on the right people. And daily, we're updating our modeling with this data to show an accurate picture where the electorate stands that day. Today in the United States, we have somewhere close to four or 5,000 data points on every individual. After we re-rated our polling, it allowed us to see that a lot of these Midwestern Rust Belt states were one to three points closer than what most people thought. How did you know what the voter was this year was not going to be what happened in 2012? Clearly, other groups were as dynamic as you. Uh, the ability to sort of shift the way you do what you do. I think what we do differently is the combination of polling and data science. But these sorts of new technologies coupled with social media are incredibly powerful. And that is why this little known company has become such a powerful tool in politics. You did something that a lot of people who get paid a lot of money to do were not able to see and do, which is you got this right. I met Donald Trump yet, he should be kissing you today. Yeah, so Cambridge Analytica. Um, I love this quote, there are no longer any experts except Cambridge Analytica, they were Trump's digital team and figured out how to win. I mean, this is from their website. This is propaganda that they put out, and I use that word for a specific purpose because this is an actual propaganda firm. You may not know that Cambridge Analytica is a subsidiary of a firm called uh, Strategic Communication Labs, or SCL, and that company has a 20-year background in running psychological operations, or PSYOPs, in military contexts around the world, including in Afghanistan and other recent wars. So. Let's take a little look at what Cambridge Analytica actually is doing in order to try to tip elections, both in the US and Brexit and in Kenya and in other places where they've been involved. So what they do is they try to derive an ocean score. This is a personality score uh, for every adult that they can sort of cram into their database. And ocean is, another, another word for it is the big five personality score, and it stands for openness, conscientious, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And depending on how each individual kind of scores on each of these axes, you can create targeted advertising that will modify your behavior. Now, that's an important point. We're not talking about necessarily changing your opinion about what candidate to vote for. We're talking about modifying your behavior. And that might include getting you to argue with people. It might include getting you not to vote and a whole variety of other potential behaviors. So if we take a look at some other materials that SCL has put out over time. Uh, this is a slide that was included in a deck talking about work that they were doing in Afghanistan. And it's sort of complicated mumbo jumbo on here, but the key thing to kind of recognize with this is this one uh, element here, TAA, target audience analysis. And what they're doing there is basically saying there's a slice of, of the population that we would like to get to behave in a certain way. How do we send them messaging? How do we give them information that's going to get them to behave the way that we want them to behave? Okay, so this is the technology that's being deployed in elections in open democracies. So this is another kind of a dashboard from an SCL piece that shows how they're addressing, um, able to address with very fine uh, kind of granularity uh, different aspects of a young unmarried males population in Afghanistan. And of course, that would be an important population to be able to kind of manipulate in a war context. So how do they take this and apply it to uh, kind of elections and everyday stuff that we do in our democracies? What they're doing is using what's called Facebook dark posts. Now, you've all seen Facebook advertising where, 
you know, you'll see an ad for a product or something. Dark posts are a little bit different. They're an advertisement, but it's sent specifically to a very tiny targeted micro audience, and no one else can see those except you and the advertiser. So as political speech, it's completely unregulated. No one knows what even messages have been sent out, and indeed yesterday, if you saw the news, uh, Facebook, uh, under testimony to Congress, admitted that they had received over $100,000 in payments from Russian-based companies to influence the U.S. election. That doesn't even include the sort of work that Cambridge Analytica claims to have been doing. That's just Russian companies trying to influence Americans. So what does this look like in practice? Well, it allows you to create different kinds of messaging that you can send to different people depending on you know, sort of what their inclinations are. So for somebody that's driven by fear, you can say Islamic radicals are killing the innocent, or maybe somebody that's gonna respond to tradition and patriotism will re respond to patriotic symbols while somebody else might be more convinced by a sort of a science, logic, reason-based argument. So does it work? Well, Aaron Banks, one of the chief funders of Brexit, made claims that they created a 1 million online followers that reached upwards of 25 millions on most week. The engagement uh, level was huge, and our FB page still grows at 3K a week. The key thing here is that all it took was 650,000 votes to sway the result in the Brexit uh, election. And that's 0.97% of the UK population. Likewise, in the US, uh, Trump lost by almost 3 million votes if you just looked at the popular vote. But by targeting specific counties and specific states, he was able to get the 70,000 vote margin that was required in order to win the Electoral College by 306 votes to 232 votes. So I've been using some of this same methodology to try to study the news and to get a sense of what's going on with this whole Trump-Russia situation and SCL and Cambridge Analytica and everything else, and it's, it's definitely overwhelming, and I'm not gonna go into the details of this map here because you can't really read it, but um, you know, the idea here is that we can actually study what the relationships between all of these different entities and get some sense of kind of where things are going. So on the left side of this graph um, is actually a lot of transactions involving Azerbaijani and Kazakhstani uh, financial transactions that Trump's been engaged in, and it's very likely that that's where the investigation is gonna go next, and it's very likely that he may be uh, taken down by this. So, a lot of people ask me, um, you know, what's going to happen? And I think that uh, at this stage, you know, we've got a tremendous conflict that's been set up. Uh, clearly, you know, there's a lot of forces that are sort of moving in on Trump, and he's feeling threatened, and. You know, whether you agree with right-wing or le left-wing politics isn't the point. We just sort of have an attack on the system right now. And whenever a conflict like this is resolved, there's a good chance that it could be dangerous and messy. So I think we need to be able to expect that. Um, in addition to that, I think we should probably expect to see kind of a continued assault on uh, consensus reality, the things that we all believe to be true. Uh, we'll be tempted to fight with each other, we'll be prompted to fight with each other, and we should resist those temptations wherever we can. Um, and indeed, you know, we've already seen uh, divisions in the right and left with the emergence of neo-Nazi groups on the right, and then increasing arguments on the left about whether it's appropriate to use violence to fight such neo-Nazi groups. In addition, to the other question that people ask me a lot is, what should we be doing about this? And, um, you know, I think, uh, Clearly, we need to protect our vulnerable democracies. Um, they are extremely vulnerable to attack as a technology, and we need to be aware of that. But a lot of the solutions that are being proposed really amount to kind of blaming the victim and saying, like, you know, you need to be better educated. You need to have browser plugins that alert people to spurious information. And while that might be a reasonable approach, it's kind of the same as saying that our democracies are being attacked because they're wearing a short skirt. <laughs> and that's not okay. We need to deal with the aggressors in this case, and that includes Russia, it includes SCL and Cambridge Analytica, and also the Mercer family that's been funding uh, Cambridge Analytica quite a bit. So, you know, I, I think we really have to, um, you know, start to focus on how do we attack uh, the people who are, would be attacking our democracies, um, you know, during peacetime. And some people have even asked me, like, you know, are we going to be at war soon? And I actually think we're kind of at war now. Um, and, you know, whether it's a new kind of cool war or a continuation of the Cold War, I can't say, but I do believe that this war will be resolve the way that other wars have been in the past. Openness will assert itself over nationalism and fear, and indeed it must, because that is our one great prayer and true hope for a prosperous shared future. Thank you.